Jaron, one of the fascinating questions that is circulating among some pretty smart scientists and philosophers deals with the question, are we living in a simulation? Seemingly a, an absurd question to ordinary people or even, mm -hmm. until you start to think about it. And when you think about it, there is very interesting ramifications. <laughs> You've come at it from a number of perspectives. Yeah. Well, what would it mean if we're living in a simulation? Um, if all it means is that we're living in a world that follows rules that we can discover, it just means that physics works and it doesn't mean very much. Usually what people mean is something a bit more, I could say almost sinister, that <laughs> there's like this other entity that's looking in on us somehow, some, that there's some player involved in our lives on a different footing than we have. That's what it ultimately boils down to. And that, and that <laughs> entity would have created this universe. Well, maybe not. Maybe they just won it in a contest or something. <laughs> Way back in the early days of virtual reality, we used to, we used to um, imagine these crazy scenarios, like what if you raised a baby in virtual reality and never told this person that they were in a virtual world? You know, what would they be like? And of course, if we did it with the kind of virtual worlds we could build today, they'd be a neurological disaster because their body would never have developed properly. It would be very cruel. So we haven't tried that. Uh, but it's an interesting question. What if you had a really good world? Could you tell? So Hans Moravec, who back in the 80s, robotics researcher, CMU, he came up with this crazy argument that goes like this. Let's suppose it's possible to build a virtual world that's so robust that somebody could plausibly limit it and not realize. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if it's possible, perhaps we'll do it. But we're in this big universe. Even if humanity doesn't do it, somewhere in the billions and billions of stars, some civilization will do it. And if they can do it once, they'll do it twice. Because once you can do a technological trick, you can replicate it. So but eventually, if it's possible at all, there ought to be tons of virtual worlds. But there's only one base reality that all these virtual worlds in. Right. So if you suddenly find yourself born into some reality, the chances are it's right. a virtual reality because right. there's more of them. Okay, right. that's the argument. Right. Now, the counter argument is interesting. In order to make virtual worlds good enough to be like the one we're in, where we can perform fancy physics experiments, you'd need a quantum computer. Well, would you absolutely need it? You'd be happier with a quantum computer. Oh, sure, because you have to now, simulate quantum events because we have yeah. quantum events in our world. Now, if you build quantum computers, the cleanest way to think about how they work is a particular wonderful interpretation of quantum interactions that's due to Everett, which is the many worlds interpretation. So this way of thinking has a lot of copies of your computer and they're all in different worlds, and they're all running at once, and that's why they can do tricks that just this ordinary computer in this world couldn't do. And then when you get your answer out, you can think of it as discovering which world you're in. Okay. Now, so, and all of those worlds, in a sense, have to be real, not simulated worlds. They're all real, yeah. yeah. Now here's the interesting thing. Um, because the many worlds interpretation has become so much popular with the advent of interest in uh, quantum computing, now there are all these other ideas about multiple worlds. There's Max Tegmark's ideas, and there's Lee Smolin's ideas, and there's, uh, the, uh, there's this idea of a landscape of string theory, cosmos. Um, there's all of these different ideas. Now, if all of these allow for an infinity of different worlds that exist in parallel, if you like, all of a sudden, I mean, if you have an infinity of worlds, you can't have more than infinity, so you can no longer have more virtual worlds than worlds. <laughs> right. So in order to make quantum computers in the first place, you've probably convinced yourself that there are an infinity of real worlds, so all of a sudden your chances of being in a virtual world have gone way, way down. Yeah. And the argument, <laughs> counter-argument to that is what Paul Davies says. And Paul Davies says if you have multiple real worlds, mm -hmm. then the odds of getting a civilization that can do virtual reality now goes up substantially. And when you can do multiple worlds, it will proliferate so rapidly that you're dealing with a higher order of infinity. 
So the a higher order, order of, of infinity, infinity. So you're giving a, like a transfinite infinity. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. I mean, you know, that's Cantor stuff. So, so what, what you have is the more you have multiple universes, the more likely you're living in a civilization. I think we're at the point where we don't yeah. know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually, you know, I've used diagonalization arguments on this, and I have to agree, we don't know enough. Um, but I will point out one other little thing, which is, let's go back to this idea of the pimply kid who's looking in on us. Now, we have, we, as humanity, have experimentally proven, in principle, that quantum cr cryptography works. Yep. And now this is a kind of secret message that is so secret that if anyone has read it along the way, quantum effects will destroy part of it. So you can be absolutely certain. And furthermore, if you were some god figure or some pimply uh, video game kid who was reconstituting the universe, in order to cover your tracks, you'd have to be able to perform a fantabulous calculation to recreate what would have been had right. you not looked. Recreate the whole universe, right. in essence. So, the fact that we've sent quantumly encrypted messages and nobody's listened either means that the pimply kid doesn't exist, is shy, polite, <laughs> considerate, bored, whatever, uh, or that the pimply kid is so intensely powerful that he can actually cover his tracks. Um, either case makes me feel that we shouldn't pay attention to the pimply kid because if he's bored, not paying attention, or doesn't exist, forget about him. If he's so powerful that he can calculate any universe and has effectively calculated all of them, then we're one little tiny blip, you know, on this continuum. And there's, there's, we're so profoundly non-special from the perspective of this deity that we might as well not exist. Well, you know, these arguments at one level sound like they're kind of intellectually silly. On the yes. Other, on, but on the other hand... <laughs> For me, they're great entertainment. I think they're entertainment, but I really think they're very probative. I think they're probative of our understanding of what we know, what we don't know, mm -hmm. what we could know. So I'm all for it. I mean, we can take it, we can have fun with it, but I think there's a very serious aspect to it as well. So I support the, <laughs> the, the, the research on it. I think it's good stuff. <laughs>